people in the United States and the, how we're going to go about doing it. We are first focusing on the ecosystem of multifamily buildings. Uh, multifamily buildings in the United States are constructed in a way that there is one water meter for the entire property. So it doesn't make a difference how many tenants are there, there is only one water meter. And because of that, we do not really know how much each tenant is uh, using, how much water it's using. The tenant doesn't know how much he's using and the landlord doesn't know. The landlord pays for the entire water bill and the tenant pays some kind of fee, depends on, crea there are creative ways to make a tenant pay, but he never pays according to what he uses. And because of it, there is a big waste. Any property that it's built that way has a built-in waste of at least 30% of water. And it hurts the environment, it hurts the bottom line of the property itself. And we're talking about uh, studies that were made that without the water meters, there is up to 40% waste because if it's free, you don't really have to worry about it and you use much more than you need to. So you're probably asking what are we doing that is different than all the water meters that exist today. And there are many water meters out there today and they probably you heard about them. Those water meters, what they do is they provide metering to a single home or a single tenant. So for example, in Europe and in United and, and in Israel, uh, there is a, a, every building, no matter what it is, if it's a home or it's a, a building with many tenants, each tenant has its own water meter and each tenant pays for its actual use. And that proved to uh, conserve water and reduce consumption. But those smart water meters fit to that environment. They do not fit to environment where you have one meter to many tenants because you just don't know how much each one is using and the waste keep going on. And that's where we came up with our solution. We developed micrometers. Those micrometers do not sit on the plumbing itself. It's independent of the plumbing. So regardless of if the building is new or old or how it's constructed, if it's galvanized or if it's plus, or it's PEX or it's copper, we don't really care because we put our micrometer in each endpoint next to the appliance. So here you see under the, the toilet where we installed it, it will be one, we'll have one in the shower, in the sink and so on. The main work, the, the water meter really exists in the cloud. That's where we're doing, that's where we're getting all the information. That's how we know what is the submetering. We can do billing. We can le detect leaks and overuse, do all kinds of analysis. And we have enough data to nudge the tenants to conserve water. Our micrometers are small and they are designed for apartment living. They have 10-year battery because if it was a, with a, a shorter battery, nobody would want to deal with it. It's temper-free and it's very affordable. Our eye is less than a year. And it's extremely easy to, to install. We just installed in a 20-unit building. Four hours, we were in and out each apartment. For 15 minutes, we installed over 100 of those micrometers. The moment you install them, they start to uh, submit data. 24 and 7 for, ten, for the next 10 years. The we are two founders. My background is math and uh, software engineering. Um, I have been a project manager for many years and I have a, a experience in multifamily property I invest and, and manage. Ariel is an industrial designer and together we came up with our product and uh, we, we moving it on. There are hardly any competitors there, and those who are there were not able to solve the battery life and the cost, and that's why they never really made a dent, and that's why there is still a need for a solution. We're doing it now because regulations, that's a fair thing. California, for example, realized that without, California realized without submittering, you do not have a, you cannot conserve water. So now the mandate mandating submittering as the state's following through and, and also a, a cost of water has gone up and that's the time to do it. We have, we have traction, we have a paid customers, we in, have installation. Each one of those customers have a, a many, many thousands of units behind them. And we are starting partnership with Procter & Gamble. You realize that most of their product is water-based and they are very much into the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Uh, so now, if any of the panelists have questions, I invite you to raise your hand. Uh, I have an initial question, if I might, myself. Uh, I was just curious if you could address 
your intellectual property position with regard to exclusivity of patents and, or anything yes. else? So we, we, are a, we have patent pending on the whole system uh, and especially on the battery life. Uh, we using the, we're using regular battery, but we use it in a smart way. So it, it's a, a, you, so it can last for 10 years. And because of it, our product is temper free. You never have to open it. It's like a light bulb. It's like a, a light fixtures when, you know, the light bulb is gone and you throw it. So it's the same thing this way. It lasts for very long. It's small and that's, that's our intellectual property. We, we, um, we file for it in Israel. We are going to file for it in America. And Great. Uh, so, so I think that uh, Charlie Curtis was next up with his hand raised. Please, Charlie. Yes, hello. Uh, Esther, could you uh, outline your ask? What, what's your raise? Yes, so we, we did not raise anything until now. We are very young. Uh, we did our own funding until now, and now we're looking for $2 million so that we can um, um, come up with an uh, engineering. Engineers, they, our product, our product is working, it's proving, but in order to really go out to market, we want to do some more changes. We have to do a go past regulation, and there are many things that needs to be done to prepare it. We are planning next year to go to market. We have a lot of interest from a lot of entities, but we are not releasing it yet until we are testing, we are doing pilots right now. Great. Uh, I'd like to next ask uh, Richard, to uh, ask his question. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, can, can you review again what your pricing model is as far as the actual cost per per building, uh, labor yeah. and equipment? So the equipment itself is $25 a piece, uh, and the installation is $5 a piece, so it costs about $30. So if you look at an apartment, an apartment might have a um, 10 of them, if it's a two bathroom apartment, it depends on how many bathrooms you have to how many water points you have. So you might have 10, so it might cost you $30,000 for the apartment. Now, if you look at the cost saving in, in Los Angeles, a building of 100 units will cost you $100,000 a year. We save at least 30%, we save $30,000. So we have an ROI of a year with the buildings that we actually installed, the ROI was like eight months. And we have also SAS. The SAS costs $3 a month for an apartment, which means $36 a year. That's the beginning. As time goes by, our, um, our hardware will go lower and our SAS will go higher. And we also have billing component to it that we are billing the tenants, so we are charging for that too. And we are collecting a lot of data, which is going to be extremely valuable. Thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, I think you were next up. Please ask your question. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, he asked you real quick. Um, the fact that submetering is mandated in places like California is very compelling because you have a you have a built-in need, which is something we really look for. Um, question: Is that a mandate that's just for residential, or can it be expanded into mixed use and even into mid-rise and high-rise? Uh, you know. Yeah. Definitely. Like, we actually are now. starting now to put it in a office building in Israel, in Ranana. Uh, they, they, have, um, they have, we work next to an accountant and they charge water the same way for them. And we work, of course, uses much more. So they want us to separate it there. Our meters are modular and you can put it anywhere. You can put it in student housing, you can put it in all day jobs, in army bases, in a, in, in offices, anywhere. They will work in the private homes. In a multifamily, it's a must because they don't have anything. In other places, maybe it's nice to have, but many people like to know how they're using the water at home and that can help them too. So it's very versatile because it goes down to the lowest point, the end point of water. Thank you. I believe we're probably close, if not past the, the five minute period. Is that right, Stephen, for yep, questions? Seconds. How many? 40 seconds. Okay, uh, Amy, 40 seconds for sure. question and answer. We can do Go it. Hey, it. Esther, thanks for being here and um, agree it's a problem with a lot of opportunity to make small incremental progress. So appreciate what you're doing. Um, can you just talk about your competition? I've, I've talked with a couple of other startups in the West Coast space out here. Love that there's this in Israel and, and elsewhere, but just would love to hear from you how you see yourself positioned within that broader um, group of competitors, startups and bigger companies. So, so again, a, the smart water meters that exist today do not apply to our, 
our area. So they are very, they are like two competitors that are very sleepy and they were not able to go through the barrier. We are first on the market and PNG, they made, they have now the, the, their initiative of a 50 liter home, which is really very low amount of water. And they were searching the whole world for startups and they found us because there is just nobody who does what we're doing. And our solution is the only one that's available for a multifamily building. So I don't think, as long as we are gonna be first on the market and move and we are there already, we're doing already our, our traction, then we should have a very big share of the market. Well, well thank you, Esther. Thank uh, you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. We're moving to the next presenter. Uh, but while we're moving, uh, Ken, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Ken is one of our sponsors. Uh, please um, introduce yourself, Ken August. Hello, I'm Ken August with August Law Group in Irvine, and uh, just delighted to be participating, JJ. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Our pleasure. Just tell us a little bit what you do, because we got people listening. <laughs> so, so we're a uh, we're a, a boutique law firm that specializes in uh, financial and business transactions. We work quite a lot with startups, and we do have a, a heavy emphasis on cross-border transactions. Thank you, Ken. Um, all right, uh, next company uh, to present is ChargeNet. Please raise your hand. Isn't it not BN Nano? Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. Thanks. Be Nano first. Sorry, Ash. <laughs> All right. Be Nano. Steve. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Sure. I skipped over them. <laughs> JJ, can you put up the link or can someone put up the link for the third one? Yeah. Uh, Stephen, uh, put the link for Be Nano, please, um, in the chat. Uh, the link is on the chat. Okay, we just put it up, yep. Okay. Hello everyone, can you see the screen? We do, thanks Steve, uh, whenever you're ready. All right, so I am Steve Wilsensky. I'm one of the co-founders of Via Nano. We are an advanced manufacturing company based in Burlington, North Carolina. And we are proud to say that this past week, Pepperdine's most fundable companies named Via Nano a platinum winner, one of only three from 4,500 companies awarded this honor. At BN Nano, we're leveraging innovation and cutting edge material science to transform, revitalize, and revolutionize industrial commodities. We pioneered the patent pending nanobar, which is a unique and enhanced boron nitride nanotube. And when you add this to common materials, you improve their natural properties, changing them into extraordinary materials. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, it means you can turn aluminum into something as strong as steel or titanium, and even carbon fiber. That polyester can behave like Kevlar. And it means our materials can provide new capabilities in water purification, remediation, and fire prevention, just to name a few. So the nanobarb is a revolutionary material. Again, it's an enhanced version of the boron nitride nanotube, and it was first explored in the mid 90s. And since then, this material has been identified as being necessary to advance future technologies. But from the onset, we focused on both the business and the technology. We wanted to make our process elegantly simple from the supply chain to the manufacturing process to how easy it is to use for our customers. And we're currently the only company in the world with a commercially viable manufacturing process for the boron nitride nanotubes. Our costs are orders of magnitude lower than our competitors, our quality is higher, and our IP portfolio protects our boron nitride nanobars. And from the simple idea, the first idea of the boron nitride nanotube, we've expanded our product offerings to include custom mixing and blendings of our materials into customers' proprietary chemistries. We've also begun to offer enhanced copper and enhanced aluminum master alloys. And we're developing coatings for fire protection and materials that will help clean up water supplies around the globe. While there are a number of applications that you can use our material, and today we're gonna to focus on the clean tech market, specifically water, metals, and fire. And we're gonna start with aluminum. The importance of using less aluminum or light weighting extends well, belong high, well beyond high tech and into clean tech. For example, the International Energy Agency reported that metals manufacturing and other heavy industries contribute to an estimated 26% of all global green, greenhouse gas emissions. And when you consider the environmental impact of aluminum usage, it's important to note that China uses more than, supplies more than 50% of all aluminum globally. 
And the smelters in China that use that use more electricity than the whole UK economy. And almost all of the manufacturers that smelt the aluminum use coal. So coal is obviously a, you know, a, a dirty form of energy. So adding the nanobarbs to aluminum will increase the mechanical properties. The growth of the graph on the top right shows how it can increase the strength of aluminum in the alloys beyond titanium, beyond composites, and even close to steel. These improvements can help reduce the aluminum usage by up to 40%, which would have a direct impact on energy consumption. It's also going to help bring back jobs to the U.S. You can revitalize the U.S. aluminum industry by adding more value to this material. And the aluminum lightweighting market surpasses $200 billion annually now to, to fire protection. There's currently no shortage of materials used for fire protection. And while the, when the most common materials burn, they release harmful toxins that a growing body of evidence links to adverse health effects on animals and humans. These include things like cancer, damage to neurological functions, and endocrine and thyroid disruptions. Nanobarbs can be used to make novel fire protection coatings and can be embedded to other materials like textiles and plastics to make them more fire resistant. This nanobarb protection will eliminate or reduce the amount of toxic materials that are needed. And the fire protection market is also large, approaching a billion dollars years annually. Now we talk about water. Billions of people drink contaminated water every day. And today there's been an increase in awareness in the presence of what's called forever chemicals in our drinking water supplies. Forever, forever chemicals are common industrial waste and in tiny concentrations, these fluorinated chemicals can cause harm to people and animals. There's not an effective way to remove these contaminants, but there is evidence that we can use nanobars to make novel filters and re remediation materials to remove these contaminants. We've also proven that we can effectively remove common contaminants like petroleum waste and textile dyes. And the short term opportunity here is greater than a billion dollars as well. These are just a few of the addressable markets that we can approach. Um, today we're post revenue. We are have, supporting a market in the clean tech that's greater than 200 billion. We're targeting a $5 million raise and at present we have not started raising this round. Our financial modeling shows that this funding round will enable operations through 2022 with additional activities funded through our revenues. At BN Nano, we believe the next big thing is very, very small, and that BN Nano will transform commodity materials and bring manufacturing jobs back to the US. We're motivated by the opportunity to grow our team and we'll continue to make the ordinary extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, so panelists, uh, please raise your hands. I see Kathy has her hand raised, so please go ahead, Kathy. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, question on uh, focus. Is there a particular market you said that you're, you're post revenue? Where is your, where's your revenue coming from and where do you see within the opportunities you address the greatest opportunity for growth? So we started out our revenues. We started out the company really as with the idea that we would just be a material supplier of boron nitride nanotubes. And we've begun growing our revenues as uh, an additive that we sell in a powder form to other companies that they add to the things that they make. But there is a slow adoption for a little bit of a number of reasons. One, it's a new material, it's a new technology, and also with the, with the COVID environment, there's not being a lot of money spent in R&D. So we decided to do some things ourselves, like the master alloy, the aluminum master alloy. You can think of that like a concentrated orange juice that an aluminum manufacturer can add to their own aluminum to enhance the properties. We've begun selling that as a product, and there's been a lot of growth with that particular product. And we're doing something similar with, with copper. So it is powder, those are the raw material, and then the enhanced materials that we're selling. Thank you. Ken, uh, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the accessibility of the natural resource that you're using, particularly the boron. At what's the competition for that? And how do you assure enough supply for the versatility of products that you're offering? So one of the, the elegantly simple things that we like to say is, our materials made out of boron and nitrogen, and they're actually two of the most abundant elements on Earth. Nitrogen you can pull from air. Boron you can get from a number of mines, one being in Boron, California, but there's also mines in South America, in the EU, in Russia, in Turkey. Uh, at current usage, there are estimates between 15 and 30 million years worth of boron in the Earth. Um, we've also found uh, additional sources of people that synthesize boron. So we don't see that being a, a disadvantage in any way, but an advantage. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey Clark, please go ahead. 
Yeah, thanks. Can can you just walk through a little bit of the unit economics and in sort of at scale, what kind of margins you're looking like or, or looking to get? Sure. So we we do we do consider our costs to be part of our intellectual property, part of our trade secrets. But you, it's fair to say that the majority of our costs are dominated by the raw material cost of, of boron and the raw material cost of nitrogen. Today, our competitors will price a gram of this material in the thousands of dollars, certainly greater than 1,000. We will sell one gram sample for somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to $100 per gram. And we do have a roadmap to get well below $10 a gram, making this much cheaper than carbon nanotubes. Uh, even the multi-wall bulk carbon nanotubes that are in the market today, and they support, I think, somewhere between an eight and $10 billion a year market just as a raw material. Thanks. Uh, Charlie, Curtis, you're next up. Yeah, it, I'm fascinated by the number of markets that you're trying to enter and concerned about um, your focus, being able to, to maintain focus and get, get the product accepted into any one of them. Uh, what is your uh, Six, a five-year strategy on which markets you're going to hit first and second and third? So the interesting thing is that the, as a raw material, we, we have one product that we make that can service all the different materials equally. So there really is not a lack of focus from a production standpoint. What there needs to be is a focus for a sales and marketing activity. And what we've done is we have targeted some of the areas that will support um, higher prices or at least not price erosion. Things like DOD, things like uh, like getting into aluminum, where you're getting into light weighting of aerospace and space, areas where they can see very big benefits from incremental change. Um, you use very little of this material to do the enhancements, somewhere between a fraction of a weight percent to maybe a weight percent or two. So what that means is if if you need you know a, a kilogram of aluminum, you only need to have somewhere in the neighborhood of one to ten grams of our material. So it takes very little. But what we've done is in addition to having the raw material, we can service everyone through a sales team. We focused on light weighting of aluminum to be our next big market. And then we focused on manipulating and improving the thermal properties of copper as the next product. So by light weighting aluminum, as we talked about, we can make things lighter and stronger. So we can make a rocket 40% lighter of the aluminum that they use. And you can imagine what you could do with the additional payload or with the, with the reduced cost. Of, of you know launching that rocket. With copper, if you could make your laptop or your cell phone cooler because you've improved the thermals, you know, there's a lot of value there. So those are the, I would say the the, the two to three year plan. Beyond that, we, we expect to do the same thing with carbon fiber. And then through this funding activities, if we can get some funding, we think we can develop products to remediate water and to clean water pretty easily in addition to the, the FR coatings. So again, the interesting thing is every one of these applications use the identical boron nitride nanobar. So as a manufacturing process, we haven't lost focus at all, even though we were addressing all of these different markets. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I, I think I heard the, the bell for the, the end of the questioning round. Is that correct, Stephen? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Phil Gill, uh, Phil, can you can ask your last question while everybody's evaluating uh, and before we transition to the next person. Please, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, I've, nanotubes been around 15 years or so. What, what I missed, what is so special about what you have? What, what is making this so, so, so revolutionary? So it's a new material and, and some of the properties that stand out, if you compare it to a carbon nanotube, our material is an electrical insulator, but a thermal conductor. So now you can use it for things like novel heat sinks and you can put it directly onto uh, electronics. But the other main thing is our material is thermally stable above 850 degrees C. So what that means is now you can add it to things like metals, to aluminum and to other alloys. You can add it to ceramics and you can include it in materials for things that will support uh, hypersonic vehicles, for example, that experience very high thermal gradients and very high temperature. So it's the, I would say the highest temperature uh, nanotube. Thank you, Steve, very much. Um, next in line is ChargeNet. Please raise your hand. All right, Ash, you're coming in. Uh, you can start raise, uh, 
uh, share your screen and begin speaking uh, when you're ready. And there is a, in the chat, there's a link for ChargeNet uh, to the panelists. Um, so you can evaluate um, ChargeNet. Ash, whenever you're ready. Uh, you need to unmute and uh, do your video as well. There you go. OK, great. Thanks. Sorry about that. Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Tosh Dutt. I'm the CEO of ChargeNet. Uh, we're a SaaS company helping restaurants and property owners with electric vehicle fast charging and renewable energy for a COVID-free customer experience. Let's see. Next slide. California's ban on gas vehicles by 2035 is rocketing EVs into the mainstream. But in five years, we're going to need 250,000 public EV chargers. And already our utilities and current charging infrastructure just can't keep up. Uh, with how the pandemic has ravaged the restaurant retail industry, property owners and tenants are desperate. By putting fast chargers at already conveniently located restaurants and retail parking lots, we're helping them recover with a new business model that safely attracts more customers and we're solving all these converging problems together with their unique cost-effective solution. We're making EV charging synchronous with our daily lives. Uh, ChargeNet Station transforms your favorite fast food restaurant parking lot into a spot where not only will you be able to satisfy your appetite, you'll use uh, clean renewable energy to charge your car and get around 100, 100 miles of charge in 50 minutes or less, all in one convenient transaction. Unlike others, we're integrating solar and battery storage with EV fast chargers. EV drivers interact directly with their point of sale software, which generates customer profiles for us that have historical data about their EV charging habits, food choices, and other data that feed back into our optimization. Um, because we own the customer data and optimization, it opens the door for us to use this data in more creative ways. Our hardware agnostic SaaS platform we call ChargeUp uses point of sale data to maximize savings, reduce operating costs, generate more carbon credits, and improve charging station utilization while minimizing the amount of energy we buy from the grid. In fact, our energy arbitrage software sells energy back to the utilities um, at peak rates. We can displace more than 228,000 gallons of gas, eliminating over 2,000 metric tons of CO2 a year at each station. This is especially important for disadvantaged communities, um, which have a disproportionate amount of fast food restaurants and where we're able to make a significant impact. We use our modular solution to turn empty parking lots into profit centers for fast food restaurants, retailers, and their property owners. We're also licensing our software to EV hardware providers and auto companies that are building their own fast charging networks. Our software platform is hardware agnostic and it gives us access to the US's $2.2 billion EV fast charger market. We put a lot of forethought into our business model rollout. Phase one and phase two executes on our SaaS model immediately. We're also selling our software optimization strategically as a white label to automotive OEMs and EV hardware providers like Rivian, Ford, ChargePoint, and others. Um, after we've established ourselves and gained a presence in the market through our software, Phase three explores taking equity positions in the projects that we develop. We plan to grow ChargeNet with a 95% gross margin on software, yielding 20 million in revenue with a 25% EBIT in the next few years. We're breaking even Q1 2023, and we have the potential to deliver over a 10X return in three to five years. Um, we're not alone in the market. We're still in a nascent industry and the, the needs to fulfill it are still growing. Also, we're not competing with EV hardware providers because we're not building any. Instead, our software is hardware agnostic and we can integrate using APIs and open protocols that the industry has already largely adopted. Um, while we have some big names as our competitors, they're also our potential customers and acquirers. In addition to our software IP, our competitive advantage is that we're in a two-sided market that already exists and we're monetizing uh, in the middle of it. Since we started this journey, we've been fortunate to partner with some really amazing notable partners that are vested in our success and are helping us get traction in the market.
We're moving fast to orient our product development, validate our MRP, gross sales, uh, and close our $500,000 pre-seed round. Um, our first retail location with Mexico Viejo and Sanitas is opening in Q1, and we're in the process of demonstrating our software to Ford. More importantly, Taco Bell is committed to a test location, and we're in final negotiations. We're excited to help Taco Bell save the planet one chalupa at a time. Our team's commitment to fighting climate change is as much of a statement about who we are as it's to find our careers. Um, we spent years innovating clean energy solutions with companies like Tesla and Nell, building brands at restaurant groups like Taco Bell and Pepsi, and our leadership and advisors are a secret weapon. They give us the advantage to be successful in this market. Raising our convertible note pre-seed round, um, it's for 500K at a post valuation of four, 4 million. Uh, this will over the next six, six months give us the resources to complete our MRP, go live with our first site, operationalize our team, and complete agreements uh, with our test site with Taco Bell. Um, our $1.5 million seed round will follow in Q2 2021. Um, the, the most likely exit is a buyer build acquisition by larger companies in the restaurant, automotive, or energy sectors. And already we're, we're seeing uh, large companies like EDF buy PowerFlex, Shell buy GreenLots, and now buy Emotorworks and Angie buy EV Box. Um, we're charging it. Join us to fight, fight climate change now. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Tash. I I think we're uh, we the questioning uh, period, but uh, let's go forward. Uh, Richard Sudek, you're first on the list. So I I'm sort of missing what your competitive advantage is. I mean, it's obviously a lot of charging stations coming online by different groups like ChargePoint, et cetera. Can you, can you give me an overview of what your advantage is? Yeah, so our competitive advantage is that we're using point of sale data at places where you know, charging stations are gonna need to be conveniently located like restaurants and retail locations. And we're able to um, extract more savings and utilize um, the assets that we're, we're integrating on fast chargers, solar, and batteries um, to capture more revenue. So uh, that, that's sort of a generic answer. Can you go one level down? Because others are doing similar things. Um, not necessarily. Uh, no one's using point of sale data to optimize solar batteries and fast chargers. Um, a lot of times they're using building load information. And in a lot of, you know, those, those competitors, they're, um, they're, they're, uh, they're not really optimizing those assets. So they're not using AI and machine learning algorithms to tell the battery when to you know, charge an EV or to you know, use grid, grid power or uh, you know, how to, to throttle um, an EV because I, we're able to predict you know, someone's gonna spend a longer time at their charging station than someone else. So by doing that and, and also using, you know, energy arbitrage and, and rate optimization, we're able to deliver more value and more savings from, um, from the software that we're in. The other thing too is we're hardware agnostic. So we're not in the game of building hardware like ChargePoint and those guys um, uh, and, and, and others. We're, we're hardware agnostic so we can uh, integrate through OCPP, open protocol APIs with pretty much any, um, any solar inverter, energy storage inverter, and, um, and uh, EV fast charger. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Bruce, by mistake, I lowered uh, Kerry Ortiz's hand. It was up before. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so Kerry, Kerry. Please, yeah. please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, great job, Tosh. Regarding the lots, are the lots owned by the proprietor of the businesses? And have you folks secured any LOIs, MOUs for exclusive access to the lots or to a certain portion of lots? Yeah, so we have um, an LOI with a local uh, Mexican fast food restaurant called Mexico Viejo. Um, we've worked with their property owner. We have an LOI to develop the parking lot. Um, in terms of uh, you know who, how we're gonna secure that, it's, it's a combination of going, uh, working with the tenant and the property owner. A lot of times the franchisee of the restaurant is also the property owner. And that's an ideal situation because then we're just working with one entity. But you know, our first go-to is to show value to the, to the franchisee or the corporate restaurant group and then work with them and their property owner to develop the parking lot. And a lot of times we're working in a long-term ground lease. So, you know, 10, 20 years, 
and we have a provision in there where you know if the if the relationship terminates with the tenant or you know the property owner wants it out we can pull it out and we can repurpose it repurpose it at another location and we do that because the the technology is modular and it's really easy to integrate and, and, and move around understood great job thank you uh, Stephen, how's the time? We have one more minute. Okay, great. Uh, uh, Blair Simpson, please, uh, your next to ask a question. Thank you. Um, so who is your target customer? Is it the fast food franchisee? Is it the charging station hardware providers? To whom are you selling? Yeah, so um, uh, our, our customer um, is uh, restaurant, <laughs> restaurant, restaurant owners, um, franchisees, um, and their property owners and REITs. And also um, our, our secondary customer is um, automotive OEMs that are building their own fast charging networks. And we're selling them our, our optimization software, our backend, and also EV hardware providers that, uh, that want a better software package, better than you know, what, what they already have. Some of them don't even integrate software into their, into their, um, into their, their products like Tritium. You can overlay with that. Got it, thank you, sorry. And, and what of your software exists today? So um, we have uh, a demo of our software. We're able to um, run it in a sandbox environment um, with, um, with a, a charger uh, with a solar inverter and with a battery. The MRP is supposed to be complete mid-December. And so that's what our pre-seed round is for, is to help us get the development resources to complete our MRP. Well, well thank you, Tosh. Appreciate you. the thank presentation. You very much. Thanks for your great questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, Please evaluate if you have not done so, and I'll bring in the next attendee. <clears throat> Hold on one second. All right, uh, next in line is uh, fixing CO2. Please raise your hand. Alma, I'm bringing you in. All right, Alma, whenever you're ready. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, you can uh, also share your screen. There you go. Oh, really? You can start when you're ready. There yeah, you go. Yeah, I'm just sharing my screen now. Okay, can you hear my screen? Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, make it full screen so we can see it. Okay. All right, so hi, my name is Alma. I'm a founder at Fixing CO2, where we convert CO2 into clean fields and chemicals. And at Fixing CO2, we strive to disrupt the current fossil fuel fuel-based economy and replace it with carbon neutral one. We protect the environment by converting CO2 emissions into clean fuels and chemicals. And empowering of women is demonstrated by our majority female-owned startup. We believe that through research and innovation, we can build strong and sustainable future. Did you know that 2020 um, is the second warmest year on record globally? And if climate change is an existential crisis, then why don't we treat it as a coronavirus? Rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere and global temperature increase are serious issues that require collective efforts and extraordinary solutions. Our company Fixing CO2 is focused on carbon utilization through the electrochemical CO2 reduction. We are building an electrolyzer that converts CO2 to CO using renewable energy such as solar and wind. We can further combine clean CO with clean hydrogen, generate synthesis gas, and using fissure trapped process, produce any fuels and chemicals that are currently being produced by oil and gas industry. We want to recycle CO2 to clean fuels and chemicals using electricity and water and close the carbon cycle. Our technology was developed at UC San Diego. 
This research was originally funded by JPL NASA as an effort to build a reactor on Mars for the next human mission. JPL is currently using our technology and serves as an external technology validator. We patented our technology through UCSD and our company has an exclusive license to this technology. Um, carbon monoxide is used as a feedstock in various industries. The market for CO alone is around $3 billion, whereas the fuels and chemicals market is currently at $100 billion, and it's expected to grow to $400 billion by the year of 2030. So as you can imagine, the market ecosystem is enormous. For CO, we identified two main um, group of customers. The first group is represented by large chemical companies like Dow Chemicals, BASF, Covestra. These companies consume CO as a monomer for production of various chemicals such as polycarbonates, acetic acid, polyketones, and many others. The second group of customers are large uh, gas companies that buy CO in bulk and redistribute it to smaller CO consumers. In general, our customer could be any CO2 emitter that want to get rid of CO2 emissions and get clean chemical products instead. And with increasing regulations around car carbon emissions, um, this path is inevitable. So we are planning to build a lab scale prototype by December 2020 and we're actually finishing um, the feasibility experiments right now. At this point, we raised around 150K in non dilutive funding. So this year, our company won the British Petroleum Zero Emission Prize startup competition and we got some money from, through the NSFI Corps and we also um, invested our own money. This year, we were also participating in CleanTech Open Accelerator, and we just accepted to the Berkeley SkyDeck Incubator. Uh, by, this, by September 2021, we are planning to build a printer size prototype and perform field tests. For that, we are raising one million. By the year of 2022, we want to build a modular reactor, and for that, we are going to need around $5 million. So this is our team. Uh, my name is Alma. I received my PhD from UC San Diego. I previously worked at Stanford and Caltech and I have 10 years experience in electrochemistry and electrochemical CO2 reduction. We also have Elder, he has a PhD in mathematics from Caltech and he previously founded the company in Silicon Valley and successfully, successfully sold his company in 2017. And we have Anya, our third co-founder. Anya graduated with PhD in physics from Caltech this spring, and she worked with us since the beginning and recently, recently officially joined our company. We also have a, a very diverse advisory board with the world experts in CO2 reduction. The development of zero emission economy is an important step toward a sustainable future that will impact billions of people around the world. And me and my teammates at Fixing CO2 are working hard to achieve it. If you're passionate about issues around climate change, then join us in our efforts. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you, Alma. Uh, I see that uh, Richard has his hand up, so please go ahead. Uh, I'm very impressed by your team and your technology, <clears throat> but I'm wondering who on your team is actually uh, scaled up companies, et cetera. So I see there's a lot of uh, technical expertise, but can you tell me a little bit more about the business expertise on your team to actually build the company? Uh, so I also have my teammate Elder. He is actually um, working on business development. So he's right here right now and he, he will um, answer that question. Hey guys, thank you. Um, so we, we do have uh, uh, scientific advisors, but listed here is our advisory boards with Slightly bigger roles are Charles Zal and Alan Waskin. They're serving as COO and CFO currently. They have a lot of expertise helping a lot of startups to scale. I have a successful exit behind my back. It was in a different field in AI for sports analytics, but um, you know, uh, having that experience, I think we can grow this company. And uh, we're uh, kind of, uh, we gain a lot of business development expertise through the accelerator programs that we've been participating and continue to participate in. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Charlie, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Um, what is your pricing target for, for your prototype reactor and how, what's the volume throughput you can do with this? I mean, how much does a company need to spend to uh, get this into their system? So uh, we're thinking that our business model will be um, 
in either the selling the equipment, the electrolyzer. So we're not selling the CO, we're selling the equipment, the electrolyzer at about 50% profit margin. And um, uh, the, the customers will use it to make their own CO on site and control their own supply. Um, our uh, projections are, as I said, so there is going to be about, you know, it's cost about $40,000, the, the scale that we're aiming at. And um, it costs about 20,000 to produce that. Um, in order to build that equipment, we don't actually have to start from scratch. Um, as Alma said, uh, uh, showed in the ecosystem slide, uh, we can basically take hydrogen electro uh, electrolyzers that are currently existed and are scaled and modify them to produce, to instead of producing, splitting water into hydrogen oxygen, to convert CO2 into useful chemicals. Um, so there's a, a reduced risk on the scale up side and there's already, these devices are already out there. What we need to do is just modify them to serve our purposes. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if Jeffrey had a question or not. I saw his hand up. Uh, uh, it was actually covered uh, by Charlie, so thanks. Okay, great. Uh, well, I don't see any other hands up, but uh, I'll ask a question. Uh, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, intellectual property that you have in place? Uh, yeah, so the technology uh, that Alma developed is a unique m material for the electrode, uh, for the catalyst on the electrode of the electrolyzer. And we have um, patented through UCSD, now we have an exclusive license uh, to that technology. Uh, we're also planning to expand our IP portfolio with uh, works in the reactor design and further catalytic work, but uh, this already is the main component of the electrolyzer that essentially uh, drives this reaction of CO2 conver conversion for CO. And CO, you might have not heard a lot about CO because it's a very niche industry, but CO is really a precursor in the cycle to produce any products of petrochemical industry. So anything you can get from oil, you can get from CO. And there's other pathways of utilizing CO2, but this cycle is the only one that where every single part is scaled. It's working at a very large industry scale. So fissure chops has been around since World War II. Hydrogen is produced, clean hydrogen is produced in large quantities by electro, electrolyzers and the renewable energy is deployed at scale already. The only link missing here is CO2 to CO conversion. And that's what we're working on. That's where our technology has very high selectivity. So we can produce almost pure CO and high energy efficiency. I see. Well, thank you. Uh, Amy, I see you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for being here. Um, I was just curious if you can talk us through what you see as your pathway towards commercialization and scaling up. You know, I'm familiar with Lanza Tech and, and know that founder and some of the other large technologies in the capture and conversion space. And we'd just love to know if you're envisioning, you know, going joining with others and partnering or scaling up yourself or how you see that taking shape. Absolutely. Yeah. So actually, our, our uh, competitors that are working in this space already, uh, they've been partnering with Lancetech. So uh, that's definitely uh, one of the pathways. Uh, in, uh, unlike other competitors, we want to focus on CO only because, as, as I said, it's a part of Syngas. So it's a precursor for any petrochemical products for Fisher Chops technology. Um, so our partners, we envision partners on uh, the hydrogen side, this is the most immediate partnerships that we need. We envision partnerships with uh, renewable energy providers because uh, from on one hand, you can just use it as a, uh, a means to reduce CO2 emissions and turn it something valuable. On the other hand, for some applications in certain um, uh, cases, you can use it as a power to X technology where the excess renewable energy that is generated by renewable energy providers could be converted into valuable products. So. Um, there's, there's a lot of partnerships there. And of course, Lanzatech is one clear example of a CO consumer. We think that the biggest markets, uh, our systems that, uh, sorry, segments that we identified on the CO side are these chemical companies. This is a clear path for us to commercialize because we don't need any reg help from regulations. We just need to scale the technology and make it work to already be successful in this market. And in fact, one of the uh, companies that does this a slightly different technology using high temperature, they need 700 Celsius to run the reaction. They're already commercializing in the, in the second segment here. So uh, that, that, that need is kind of confirmed. Um, but CO is not our end goal. Of course, our end goal is to partner with carbon capture companies, hydrogen companies, and produce clean fuels and chemicals, which is an enormous market. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Blair, I think we have time for your question. Go ahead, please. Great, thank you. Uh, 
you mentioned your your first target customer, um, the CEO consumers, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, have you had conversations with them about how they could integrate your product into their operations? And if you learned anything revelatory from those conversations? Absolutely. So we went through the NSF iCorps program, which basically uh, forces you to run customer interviews. And we've spoken about 40, we ran about 40 plus customer interviews so far, and we're about to join the national stage and run another 100 customer interviews to confirm the specific deployment. But for CO consumers, especially on the gas distribution side, so because this technology is modular, as you can see, I don't know if you can see this clearly, but basically uh, the reactor that we're building can be modularly scaled, put in a container and basically attached to their site already. And uh, we've actually seen how it's done already with the high temperature electrolysis solutions and ours are gonna be more efficient and essentially save them more money down the road. But yeah, we're right. talking about dual chemicals. Yeah, and on the chemical side, uh, we've spoken with those companies. That deployment is, of course, is bigger scale. So we're probably going to attack the gas distribution market first. Uh, but for them, uh, it's uh, there's a lot of um, uh, logistics to be figured out. But right now, they're paying. Essentially, bottom line is the CO consumers right now pay a huge transportation cost because all the CO in North America is produced at the steam methane reforming plants. They're all in the Gulf Coast. Everyone else who needs CO, they need to get it delivered in a pipeline or a tube trailer. And this technology allows them to convert their CO2 emissions, which are trying to get rid of, into CO, which they need. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, time's up, Stephen, right? Thank you, guys. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, next in line is a Grow Guru. Uh, please raise your hand. All right, Patrick. Yeah, please evaluate if you have not done so. Uh, and uh, now the link for uh, Grow Guru is uh, in the chat for the next presentation. Um, Patrick, whenever you're ready. Okay. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Great. We can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, All right, I'm Patrick Henry, the CEO of Grow Guru. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur with multiple exits, including an IPO that led to a billion dollar valuation. Um, at Grow Guru, we're all about strategic irrigation management. We help farmers make more money by increasing crop yield and more efficiently using water and other scarce resources in a sustainable way. Uh, the global agriculture market is $2.4 trillion annually. And if you fly over Kansas or Nebraska, this is what you'll see, uh, millions of acres of irrigated farmland. But we're faced with a global problem of catastrophic proportions where we have too many people, not enough food, and not enough fresh water, and the problem is just getting worse. On top of that, farming is really hard. Uh, farmers are faced with many difficult challenges, and any solution you bring to the market has to solve a big problem, uh, be easy to use, and provide a quick uh, return on investment. And optimal irrigation uh, has the single biggest impact on crop yield and crop quality. And ultimately it's really about managing the root zone of the crop. So how do farmers uh, ma make irrigation decisions today? Uh, well, the vast majority of them are using suboptimal methods for irrigation management. Only about 10% are currently using soil sensors, but with big benefits. Uh, unfortunately, or actually fortunately for GrowGuru, um, all the competitive alternatives in the market require annual installation and removal in field crops like corn and soybeans, also sometimes, sometimes called broad acre row crops. And uh, GrowGuru provides a permanent installation solution. And 85% of the irrigated acreage in the U.S. market is, are these field crops. So how do we do it? Um, so we bury the soil sensor below the till depth so farmers can just farm over the top. And we use our patented wireless underground system, we call it the WUGS, to communicate from underground to the above ground telemetry communication system 
where we use conventional wireless technologies uh, to get that data into the cloud. Uh, in the cloud, we add additional information like weather forecasts, the as-applied data from the, uh, the irrigation system, and apply machine learning to give farmers recommendations on when and how much to irrigate. Uh, and we do that over a simple, intuitive, farmer-friendly user interface that they can access on their uh, mobile device or tablet or computer. And in our next generation of the product, uh, we'll be able to go mobile in the above ground portion of the solution and uh, mount it on a drone or center pivot irrigation system. So GrowGuru um, massively reduces the total cost of ownership by reducing the need for annual installation and removal. You install it once every five years. Uh, that also improves scalability because we can do the install during the six month fallow season when there aren't any crops in the ground. Um, and that just makes things much smoother, much more efficient, and provides significant improvements in scalability that have, haven't existed up to this point. Uh, our typical results, so we get about a 10 to 20% increase in crop yield, as well as a 10 to 20% savings on uh, input costs. And by having the soil sensors permanently installed, the farmers get year-round data. They can measure winter snowmelt. They can measure preseason irrigation and do year-to-year -year comparisons. And with machine learning, the system continues to get better over time. Uh, the market's potentially massive at full penetration. Uh, it would be $2 billion per year in the US market and $20 billion worldwide. And as you can see, the, the vast majority of that is in uh, annual field crops. Uh, we currently sell the hardware and provide an annual subscription. Uh, but we're moving to a full subscription model uh, where it'll be all recurring revenue. Um, most of that we're, we're launching this fall. We've been to market testing on that in the spring, but um, a lot of farmers, I'd say 90% of them want to go to the subscription only model. Uh, we sell through a combination of direct sales and a dealer network. And uh, the dealers now represent about a 6 million acre footprint of, of opportunities. Um, we've been deploying uh, really since 2017 and the, the wireless underground solution more in the Midwest since early 2019. We have over 800 sites deployed and uh, over 100 customers across 20 different crop types, and we're just getting started. Uh, we've got a team with the uh, technical domain and business expertise to win in this market. Uh, expertise really in electrical engineering, communications, uh, soil sensor technology, uh, near field communication, and crop science. Uh, we're off to a big growth tear. Uh, we've been growing at a very rapid clip over the last few years. Time is up. And, okay, and uh, we're in the process. We just recently, this summer, completed a $2 million uh, equity crowdfunding campaign. And uh, next spring, we'll be launching our Series A financing, uh, looking to raise seven to $10 million to continue to uh, build and grow the company. Well, thank you, Patrick. Sure. Uh, do we have any questions from the, the panelists? I, I see uh, Kathy had her hand up first and after her question, uh, Blair. So please, Kathy, go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for the presentation. What does it cost a farmer to, one, either install this? It's not clear to me. You said that I think 50% of your sales are hardware and you're moving to a subscription only model, but what would it cost a farmer? Or, or, yeah, so, so the typical install right now is they install one sensing location per irrigation zone, which is typically 120 to 150 acres. Okay. So the hardware cost uh, at retail is about $3,000 and the annual recurring revenue in the hardware sales model is about $500 per year. As we move to the full subscription model, it's, it's more like $1,000 per year annual subscription. There's an activation fee uh, of a few hundred dollars in year one but then it just continues on with that annual subscription. So the, and, um, the dollar per acre per year is around 10 to $12 per acre per year. And the payback period is less than one growing season. And in, in fact, in irrigated acreage, there's typically about a six to eight uh, re return on investment in year one. And that continues every successive year as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. good clarity. Uh, great. Um, so, Talk to me about your customers. You have about 2,500 sensors deployed. Uh, are these all one type of farmer? Tell me about the customer profiles. Yeah, so we're currently deployed in 
California, which is pre predominantly perennial crops, those are permanent crops like fruit and nut trees. And most of the business that we have in the Midwest is broad acre row crops. So corn, soybeans, cotton, sorghum, winter wheat. Um, and the real big growth opportunity is really in the Midwest um, where they have these broad acre row crops because we offer the permanent install in those, in those situations uh, where the competitors need the annual installation and removal. Uh, typically, um, in the field crop market, um, there's about six sensors per site because uh, they're at various different depths. And in the perennial crop market, there's about three sensors per site um, at various depths. And, and who's loving this of those customers? <laughs> you know, both the customers and the dealers love it. So the, the vast majority of the customers we're converting uh, were already using the competitive alternatives. So they were sold on the value of the soil moisture sensors, but they hated the annual installation and removal treadmill. So we're kind of the 2.0 version of, of that. Um, and, you know, really simplifies things for them. A lot of them are what we call deficit irrigators. They may use 20% of their irrigation budget before they put crop in the ground. And with the competitive alternatives, they're flying completely blind on that. So um, the dealers like it because it's a much simpler install. You only have to do it once every five years. The farmers like it because it gives them year-round data, pre-season irrigation data, full season of irrigation, and year-to-year -year comparison. So it's, um, it's, hitting, it's hitting the market really well. Thanks. Uh, Charlie, please go ahead with your question. Yeah, could you, uh, you covered this some, but uh, a little more detail on going to the market, you're using dealers as your, as your uh, avenue in, is that correct? And they do the install and so you're just manufacturer or how does that work? Yeah, so we typically, um, because we have a, a, a good knowledge of where the best market opportunities are based on our team's experience, we'll go into a region and work with early access partner farmers, kind of teaching customers, and that are also influencers in that region. And then we'll identify a channel partner in that region. Sometimes it's a, a farm equipment OEM or an irrigation equipment dealer or a farming co-op or an agronomy group. And it varies kind of um, region by region. So we select kind of a, a best in class dealer for that market. Many times it's a dealer that had pre previously sold our competitors products. Um, but again, they hated the annual installation and removal. So it didn't, wasn't really scalable. And it had to be installed when labor was most scarce around the time of seeding and planting. So this gives them a significant advantage um, in the marketplace. Uh, so that's typically what we're doing today. Stephen, I think we probably have time for one more question. Is that right? Oh, no, we're out of time. Okay. Well, I'm sorry for that. But uh, Patrick, thank you very much for your presentation. So maybe while everybody's evaluating, Richard, you can ask your question. What was, the, value what was the valuation? Great. Um, the last uh, round that we did was a convertible note with an eight, ha eight and a half million dollar cap. 20% discount, 6% interest rate. We haven't yet done a price round. Richard Sudek, so your last question. Yeah, I, maybe I missed it, but how much money have you put into the firm? Uh, we've raised a total of about five point eight million. How much? Uh, have you me personally? Put? Yeah. Oh, I've put in three hundred k. So that seems a little disproportionate based on your exit you previously had. Well, I mean, I'm I'm a founder of the company. I went without salary or basically less the minimum wage for for two years as well. So, um, okay. I think I've made a pretty significant commitment to the company, both financially as well as sweat equity. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, please uh, uh, finish up your evaluations uh, while we bring in. Actually, sorry, we're gonna take we're we're halfway through. Uh, we're gonna take a five minute break, so we'll be back at. Um, 26 after the hour. So 26 since we're all over uh, the country here. So five minute break. We'll be right back and- Hey JJ, quick question. Yeah. Uh, do you know if the SEC raised the Reg CF limit from 1.07 to five or is that still in flux? They're still working on it. As far as I'm concerned, I, I heard they're still working on it. It's yeah. not there yet. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah.
someone just said that it did change to five. So maybe it is. Outstanding. That's exciting. <laughs> I know it was close. I, I thought it was going to happen recently, but I, I didn't know that it did happen. So Yeah, yeah. By the way, we've been working with Patrick Henry for uh, uh, indirectly for a few months now. Incredible guy. Season oh. strong. Model is fantastic. Yep, that's true. All right, M Mark. I think I think you're next. Uh, you're I uh, I Karis, right? Mark, if you're hearing me, okay, yes. So you're next. Be ready to go in about three minutes. Ken, you're looking good. How are you? Oh, couldn't hear you. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm doing much better. Thank you. That's good. I really like the beard. I look like my dad now. I did a double take in the mirror the other day. <laughs> you know, um, you're saying that I look exactly like my dad with this beard. He had the beard on all his life. <laughs> <laughs> How's the family? Family is good. good. Um, um, kids are doing great. Uh, you know, distance learning, <laughs> but they're they're doing okay. Yeah. At least there are some, my, mine's doing okay. He's he's in a hybrid situation, so he's he's back at school, and they've they've got you know things that they are doing differently, but at least he's with his friends. Yeah, and, and we've done, we're, they're doing hybrid too. Two days at school, uh, three days at home. So. <laughs> That's better than it was. Yeah. Uh, JJ, this is uh, Charlie Curtis. Hey, Can Charlie. you, uh, could you, uh, Kind of fill me in on what the next steps are after we do this round. Yeah, so um, if you're, um, well, are you evaluating the companies live right now yeah. while we're doing this? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will, at the end of this, are you, are you, again, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but are you part of any other um, panels? No, I'm just clean tech. Just this one. So we will announce the winner of this panel um, on on Saturday uh, morning, um, so uh, after ev everybody evaluates, because some people evaluate live, most everybody's been doing that, but some others may evaluate like tomorrow or something. Uh, 
And uh, after, so after this round, so if you're only part of this round two, um, round three will be, get, will be on um, November, I think 12th and then on November 17th. So that's the final round where all judges are involved in that round. Um, that would be basically the, the uh, since we have right now only eight, pa eight panels or eight categories, uh, the eight winners of each of the panels or each of the categories will be uh, competing against each other for uh, a final winner. Ah, okay, thank you. All right, um, next in line, hopefully everybody's back. All right, Mark, I think you're next in line. Uh, please raise your hand so I, it's easier for me to see it. Okay, there you go, thanks. All right, you're coming in when you um, when you can share your screen, unmute. Um, and um, you can uh, start and then we'll start the timing. Can you see my screen and hear me? We can. Okay. Hello, my name is Mark Anderson, founder and CEO of Icarus RT, and I'm proud to introduce you to Icarus's novel quartet technology. Thank you for participating today and good luck to all the teams. Did you know, according to the World Economic Forum, 70,000 PV panels are being installed every hour around the globe. Quartet extracts and collects waste heat from uh, PV panels and stores the heat in a thermal battery for cogeneration to make power and or hot water on demand, in other words, after sunset. And we can do this for 50% of the cost of PV systems with lithium ion batteries. Well, one key point is that we increase PV output by cooling the panels while charging the thermal battery. Traditional systems consume PV output to charge. Also, we include hot water as a byproduct. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. However, PV generation does not match demand, especially where peak electric demand extends well past sunset into early evening, like here in San Diego. Also, PV panels are not very efficient. In fact, today's panels are at most 21% effective at converting solar energy into electric power. To make it worse, as panels heat up daily, performance drops further. Well, Quartet is a hybrid solar PV thermal cogeneration system that boosts PV uh, performance by removing the heat, collects and stores the waste heat, and converts the heat into hot water and our power. Our market is massive. In fact, the SOM <clears throat> alone in the U.S. is $400 million, and that's not including all the existing PV installations uh, that exist which can be retrofitted <clears throat> and is another massive market for Icarus. Our team is led by me. Um, I've been in the power industry for over 40 years. CTO Ron Pitt has been in the industry for 30 years. And both of us are entrepreneurs with prior experience as CEOs for engineering companies. And both of us have patents issued and pending. Gina McNamara, our acting CFO, currently works as a CFO for a much larger well-established company with 20 years of experience. Catherine Lukes, our operations manager, just joined us from the U.S. Marine Corps following a fellowship with Icarus through the Solar Ready Vets um, Hiring Our Heroes program. And Jay Franklin, our head of BD, took his company from $2 million to $20 million. Suffice it to say, the entire team is talented and passionate about Icarus and the industry, and our advisory board is comprised of industry and startup experts. Our business model is based on licensing to EPC contractors, and we earn revenue based on the capacity installed in terms of dollars per kilowatt, dollars per kilowatt hour for storage, and dollars per therm for hot water. Our go-to-market strategy begins now. Uh, we're beginning an installation of 25 kilowatt grid tight commercial beta prototype at the Imperial Valley Proof of Concept Center here in Southern California. Then throughout 2021, we'll be installing and testing and refining additional grid tied commercial betas that are already identified. 
We're working very closely with NREL. We won the NREL uh, Shell NREL Game Changer. And we're working closely with NREL to accomplish uh, design optimization and towards commercialization. Plus, we won the Berkeley Haas Clean Tech to Market program, and we're working closely with them to develop a smooth commercialization plan. Of course, we do have competitors, some cool solar panels to improve output. Others work on many types of storage technologies, and still others uh, are developing different types of solar thermal systems. However, extensive prior art and patent searching has shown that no other company is doing all three of these things in one technology or converting stored solar heat into power using organic ranking cycle. Pardon? 30 okay. seconds. Uh, our business model, whoops, excuse me. And financial projections are based on licensing to these contractors that will sell it and store the court test system. Our fees are based again on the dollars per kilowatt, dollars per kilowatt hour, and dollars per therm. These multiple streams uh, will help us to scale and meet these projections. We've raised $850,000 half and half through grants and investors. And we've developed, I just have a little bit too much here, great relationships with corporate and industry sponsors. Uh, most laudable awards, the 2019 Calcine Concept Award, 2020 Shell Game Changer, powered by NREL, 2020 Berkeley Haas, Clean Tech to Market Program. Most recently, the Qualcomm Small Business Program. Some are providing non-dilutive funds, others provide in-kind services. They all provide sponsorship, mentorship, and strategic partnership. And uh, that's it. I call this team the greatest team in clean tech for good reason. This is the team that's creating the Icarus novel technology producing results beyond our expectations. And we're excited to show you Icarus Quartet in a live virtual demo soon. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer your questions. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so if any of the panelists have questions, please raise your hand. Just, uh, just to remind everyone that um, if you continue after your time is up, it will take away from the Q&A. <laughs> so Carrie, uh, you have a question. Please go ahead. Well, Mark, great job. How much money have you folks raised to date? Uh, we've raised about $470,000. We've uh, got another $450,000 through grants. Was the initial seed, was that in a note or was that a price round? The initial seed was a private placement offering. So uh, ex exchange for equity. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, I see that you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, what is the... Uh, cost to retrofit or well both retrofit and what is the add to the cost of a panel and what's the ROI on a typical sure. install? Yeah, great question. So uh, the ROI is about 3.2 years for the additional equipment we add to pay back with the additional power that we can generate. Um, and that's about the same for a retrofit or a new install, a little bit less for a new install. Okay, uh, Benton, you're next for, with your question. Hey, Mark, good to see you. Um, can you tell us about the product pivot that you had recently? And I'm unclear as whether the NREL project was the old product or the new product. So did I mention a product pivot or did you gather that somewhere else? Um, because we did have a pivot, but I don't think I mentioned that. Yes, uh, oh. I know about it because I've seen your pitch before. Oh, okay. So, yeah, no, it didn't only come from NREL. It really came from customer discovery in programs that we were doing outside of NREL. Now, NREL has helped us to optimize the design that we made with the pivot. Um, and what Benton is talking about is uh, an initial focus on just power boosting to enhance the performance of the solar panels. But what we learned is we could extract and store the heat and use that heat for other purposes later and 
now we've learned that hot water is becoming much more important than additional power as well because of some state uh, uh, renewable portfolio standards like California and New York where they're doing everything they can to drive down emissions and cut down natural gas consumption. Does that help? That does refresh my memory. Yeah. Thank you. Good to get customer discovery and especially when you can expand your products. Uh, Jerry, why don't you ask uh, the, the last question? Uh, valuation. Our valuation now is uh, 3.7 pre-money. This current round is $750,000, which, um, you know, of course would be added to that. We have a lot of things, uh, momentum going for us right now that seem to be changing the valuation, but that's where we are, 3.7. All right, thank you, Mark. Um, everybody be careful, Benton knows your history. So. <laughs> Very good. Well, thank you, gentlemen right. and lady, and um, you guys have a great rest of your day. I look forward to hearing back from you. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Great job. Goodbye. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's great to see companies iterate and grow, right? <laughs> yep. All it's right. Not always uh, brand new. <laughs> that was pretty funny. So you really surprised him. <laughs> <laughs> What's in it? Uh, yeah, exactly. What do we do? What the, how did you know? <laughs> All right, please. Who did it? it? No, did it. <laughs> that was funny. All right, Thomas, you're coming in to present. Um, you can start your video and audio and share your screen. Also, the link for LeafPack is in the chat. Please use that to evaluate. I don't know where Thomas is. Uh, Thomas, are you there? Did we lose you? <laughs> ah, I don't know what happened to Thomas. Uh, I don't see him. Okay, so I'll bring the next company in and then we will bring Thomas in later. Maybe he got somehow dropped off, so. All right, um, how about Logic O2? Please raise your hand. Logic O2. I don't see them. Uh, Logic O2, okay, we will skip. No, there's okay. Dwayne Ernest. Dwayne. Here we go, all right, Dwayne's coming in. All right, Dwayne, um, go ahead and share your screen. Uh, Stephen, if you see Thomas uh, from Leafpack, uh, please let me know. Will do. Hi, guys. Dwayne from Logic02. I'm the CEO and a co founder. Um, we help companies enable carbon product reduction profitability. Um, we started out answering the question, why do companies spend billions of dollars greenwashing instead of investing in carbon reduction? Well, it's because companies fail to recognize revenue monetization and carbon reduction, which prohibits them from understanding and realizing why they're actually reducing their carbon footprint. Businesses that struggle to reduce their carbon footprint face substantial financial risk, fair to adopt sustainability programs or running them inefficiently can cost millions in fines, loss of contracts, and possible extinction. Currently solutions only, current solutions only solve one or two pains. So consider a chair. One to two leg chairs are not prevalent because they fall over easily. And when you fall over in sustainable planning or compliance, it can cost millions to your organization. Three leg chairs are much more stable but only satisfy needs for short time periods, which is what you see most in our market. Four leg chairs are much more stable because they remain dependent on the other legs to provide optimal support and longevity. So we've identified four key pains that prohibit organizations from monetizing carbon reduction. 
enable st enabling sustainable planning, compliance and monitoring, organizational ownership, and which results in unclear ROI. We've also noticed a shift in the market. Business Wire has reported that the environmental consulting market is declining at a negative 2.9% CAGR, and consulting agencies are currently adapting clean tech and procurement software to stay relevant. As AP News has reported, a $5 billion procurement market in the U.S. is rapidly growing with a CAGR of 10.2% forecasted by 2025. So if we follow that up with the Allied Market Research report, that global green tech and sustainability market is expected to hit $45 billion by 2026 and registering a CAGR of 26.5%. This shift is creating a huge white space in sustainable procurement. So companies like Amazon, Procter & Gamble, et cetera, are pledging net zero and carbon neutrality, but they're not really telling you how they plan to achieve it. So logic go to is for any business that aims to be carbon neutral, but lacks clear insight on how to accomplish it in a profitable way. Our platform puts sustainability and profitability at the core of an organization's business spin. Zeroing in on key carbon contributors provides organizations best possible action points towards sustainable and carbon neutral business practices while enabling them to make smart investments in their value chain. With real-time visibility into their, their carbon footprint globally, companies can, companies can make sustainable business decisions that affect ETS planning, saving them millions each year. They also are able to discover their true carbon capital and are able to mobilize it. It's clear to us that we're entering the fourth industrial revolution. Revolutions take critical mass and networks to be successful. The push for change is now, and Logic O2 is going to lead this revolution. Do we believe that individuals and companies want to contribute to a cleaner world? But they just simply don't know how to, nor do they think that their contribution would actually make a difference. And when it comes to this industry, information is not shared nor written for the end user, which leaves a huge gap in knowledge and action. We aim to close these gaps for sustainable procurement officers while building a strong foundation for reseller and referral marketing. Our goal is to create micro revolutions in companies, suppliers, and developers worldwide. We plan on doing this as a partially open source model where our IPs can stand alone or be inserted in the various different tech stacks for resale. This we hope will create a co-creation model and enable big data and AI in the future. We're a tiered subscription targeting 36K per user on an annual contract, and customers connecting up to five plus suppliers will create a viral acquisition referral funnel for us. We will leverage channel partners like AWS, SAP, and Oracle to, for referral generation, and government grants can be a large R&D revenue stream for future growth as well. Currently, we're looking to build our MVP and hunting for POCs. Our team consists of three co-founders and two advisors, I personally have run various different startups from seed to series to acquisition stage and have led teams of 80 plus globally. 30 seconds. Vitali has more than 10 years in software engineering experience and has co-founded three startups as a CTO. Sanan is currently early in his career showing 25% Q over Q growth at MotorWord. Over the next two years, we're planning on investing in these three key areas, 195K in product development, 45,000 in marketing, 50,000 in cogs and variable costs, 510,000 in salary. We're asking for 800K to give Logic O2 a two year runway and hit an initial target of 1.4 million. All right, any questions? If you have questions, please raise your hand. Tough room. Well, I see we have a couple. Uh, first, uh, Blair and then Amy. Thank you. So this, there are many competitors out there doing, you know, carbon footprint analysis, scope one, scope two emissions, and you are doing something that is unique from that is that correct and i'm curious how do you think about what you're doing differentiates you um, from others out there like what is your core innovation that others don't have absolutely it's where we insert into um companies tech stacks right 
So there are hundreds of emission calculators out there, but they're doing one specific thing. They're doing one specific calculation. Our goal is to combine globally emission calculators and start to show products, even if it's not even their product yet, but the material is used to make that product and start to be able to track that as their, their global footprint. But, and also aligning them with supplier benchmarking and peer benchmarking. So we have a 360 lifetime cycle view. We're inserted at the ERP level where we're extrapolating all of their data and we're connecting with their suppliers. So we're extrapolating all of the suppliers data. Since we were partially open sourced, we feel that those suppliers then can leverage us as being a more greener solution for themselves and start to introduce us to more customers. Was I able to answer your question or? Yes, uh, I just know this market and it's so tough um, to get adoption. So thank you for your core innovation. What about, what is innovative about your go to market where you'll uh, experience stronger adoption than what's currently out there? Absolutely. Um, we are going for the revolutionaries. Um, the reason why we want to really be partially open source is that there are developers and companies all the way through Procter & Gamble's supply chain that want to make a contribution. There are companies that I just listened to here that are looking to make innovation um, that we can add to even in the future as a supplier recommendation. Our strategy all the way down to our colors is based on revolutionary colors our logo. We, we're not sugarcoating anything at all anymore. As you can say, the gloves are off. So as we reach out, we are looking for those people that are ready to make a change, not looking to greenwash, looking for that new decisions to make. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. So I think Amy was next. Was that right? Sure, yeah. Um, and thanks for being here, Dwayne. I, I do really appreciate your enthusiasm for the topic and your, your wanting to look for novel solutions. Um, Kind of echo Blair's comments. I've been in this space for about 25 years. I sit on some of the UN task forces around scope counting, accounting missions and um, work for a large corporation managing a lot of this. There's a really, really sophisticated landscape out there now, right, of ESG players ranging from big banks to um, data clearinghouses to rating agencies. There's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of very sophisticated um, work and analysis and then about a gazillion consultants out there and, and calculators. As you said, there are hundreds, right? So just when I went through the pitch, I didn't, it didn't come across to me as seeing an awareness of that existing landscape in the market. And so you guys might want to look at how to reflect that um, and paint that picture in a way that then shows what you're seeking to do and then how you, how you would do it. Like what, what you're bringing to the table that's, that's novel and that has an access point. Um, it's just a really crowded, saturated space. And um, some of the stuff going on where we're standardizing quite a few of the um, metrics around all of this and the tooling and the greenhouse gas accounting, those details are going to be critical in your ability to break into the market, I think. And so I would just say build it around um, reflecting some of that awareness as you build it into your um, planning. And we have, and we've done um, several customer discoveries. And thank you for your feedback, because um, I can always go back and retarget some of the messaging uh, to reflect that understanding. Um, for instance, Draper was trying to do a project in Austin, Texas, two years ago. They planned on this for two years, all these emission calculators that are out there, and they still took a $14 million loss because they were unable to complete their project. So yes, there are a ton of, ton of calculators out there. They're also only taken into small portions, and they're not taken into a global, the, the actual true global footprint. So they're not taking into API weather data from Google Chrome to understand that a vehicle will actually um, extrapolate more CO2 if it's on a warmer day. Or say they're not taking into account a fleet of vehicles for shipping if they're EV or if they're still carbureted or fuel injected. So, there, so I certainly understand there, there's, it can be a niche space, but we feel that when we looked at the top competitors in the market, say like supply shift, Supply Shift still needs Coupa. Coupa still needs Supply Shift or EcoVadas to complete the solution. So when we did magic quadrants on what was actually needed as a solution and how to easily make it resellable, this is the solution that we felt was provocative enough. Um, but I'd be happy to take any more feedback that you have off screen um, to see what would make this pitch a little bit better for you. 
Thanks, I appreciate the engagement. Are you guys familiar with the International GHG Accounting Protocols? Just a... Yes, yes. Um, one of our advisors is very big on compliance um, and she has turned her head more towards that instead of we are trying to be more compliant in India as we see that as the biggest growing market um, for us. Um, but she's steered us clear from that as a compliance and the accounting measures. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dwayne. I, I think that's the end of the questioning period for this uh, attendee. Is that right, JJ? Yes. Yep. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will bring in the next presenter. Um, so uh, the leaf back, he's trying to get back in. Somehow he got kicked out. So uh, while the next presenter is presenting, I'll try to bring him in. Uh, for now, uh, me, uh, my Tiro, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Okay. Um, again, uh, it's easier for me to see uh, the raised hand so I can bring you in. I don't see it right now. Um, me, Tiro. Number nine on the list. Okay. Robert's uh, presenting, but he's not here. Yeah, he's not here. I don't see him. Again, it's easier for me not to look through 20, 30 presenters. So uh, next one is plant culture. Please raise your hand. All right, Sanjay. All right, Sanjay's coming in. Um, Sanjay, when you're ready, uh, please uh, share your screen and uh, we will start the timing when you do that. And uh, meanwhile, while he's presenting, I will try to bring in Thomas from Leaf back again. Cool, can you, share, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome, all right, give me one second here. All right, everybody. Thank you for coming to listen to Plant Culture today, and thank you for being a judge at this wonderful competition. I am CEO of Plant Culture, and we are modern vertical farming. We are vertical farming with process automation and energy generation. We use 90% less water and fertilizer than growing in soil. We get 10 to 200 times the yield of growing in soil, and we get double the yield of competing vertical farms. We also use no pesticides. Now, why we're doing this is because modern agriculture is extremely wasteful. In the field, due to pests, pests, disease, and pathogens, in organic agriculture, 50 to 60% of the yield is lost at the field level. Not only that, 70 to 90% of water and fertilizer used in the field is completely wasted. And the worst part about this is that in standard agriculture, by the time food gets to your supermarket, 30 to 50% of it is lost to your shipping and handling. So vertical farming today is also good, but it's also inefficient. One third of operations are profitable, one third of them are break even, and one third go out of business every year. And the reason is that vertical farms are difficult to operate and power management strategies are off the, off the whack. 80% of energy used in vertical farms is used for heating and cooling and the balance is used for lighting. Now we're doing this because we have a massive market. For leafy greens and microgreens, it's a two and a half billion dollar market in the USA and strawberries is a $3 billion market. That being said, vertical farming is a 20% CAGR industry. It's on track to being $6.4 billion by 2023. And I'm able to be participating in this audience and this market because of a great team. This is my third ag tech startup. My last ag tech startup, Farmex, is worth about 50 million and it started with $500 in my garage. My co-founder, Dr. Heiner Leith, is a world expert in vertical farming, the greatest living mind that is not retired. He is a UC Davis professor in crop ecology. And the best part is that he's consulted for nearly every one of our top competitors in this field. My other co-founder, Dave Katragata, is a serial founder. He's helped create $3 billion startups, and he took 150 k and turned it into $480 million himself. My other co-founder, Srini Reddy, has founded two CEA companies that are multi-million dollar successes, and Dale and Mark have worked together as Silicon Valley veterans for a number of technology exits. What we have today is a platform, a prototype that's been developed at UC Davis. 10 years of research materials, labor going into what we've created. It's the most efficient vertical farming platform in the world. We've used about half a million dollars to create this and we have a platform that anywhere, whether it's land, parking lots, rooftops or warehouses. What it is, is a combination of vertical farming, photovoltaic energy generation and proprietary plant growing processes. 
essentially what we do is we generate locally and we power our indoor production nursery where are grown and seeded, and then they move out to greenhouse final production. And what we have now is a huge market. Our customers are supermarkets. We plan to deploy that's about 1,000 gross per container where we list directly to the supermarkets where we grow in store. Now with a standard supermarket chain, Albertsons, Aldi, Costco, Trader Joe's, it's about 500 stores. We expect to reach $100 million in, in revenue with 500 stores, the average supermarket chain. Within 10 years, we see ourselves growing to $250 million to $400 million in revenue, partnered with one supermarket and Amazon Fresh Deliveries to get hyper-local, fresh delivered produce. Now pioneers exist in the space and most are facing, facing problems due to unoptimized systems and a lack of energy generation. Additionally, my co-founders have consulted for a number of these competing startups and we understand that we are a modern vertical farming. We combine hydroponics and aeroponics, an attack focused on high value crops and the best of both worlds getting greenhouse and plant factory efficiency. Now, why is this important? It's important because plant culture simply costs less. In microgreens, 18% less. In strawberries, 187% less. And in leafy greens, 20% less. And these numbers mean a lot because our profits, we really drive them. We, because we're doing hyper-local production, close to the end consumer, we get 60% more percent microgreens, 125% more profit in strawberries, and 104% more profit in leafy greens. And we expect to be growing to $100 million plus company in five years with 500 super supermarket farms in the wild. Now, what we're looking for today are investors who care about sustainability and the future of food. We're specifically seeking investors that have connections to supermarkets, and we're looking for $5 million of capital in order to pilot our solution with a supermarket chain and grow with debt from there. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be happy to answer all your questions. Appreciate your time today. Well, thank you, Sanjay. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, let's see some uh, raised hands. Ah, great. Uh, so, uh, Jeffrey, I think you're first on the list, and then uh, Kathy after him. Yeah, thanks, Sanjay. Um, I'm just interested a little bit in understanding how this, how you stay on top of this market versus just kind of showing everyone the way that this market should evolve. So the way we're going to be on top of this is with one supermarket partnership, will have enough scale to be the number one leader in North America. We understand that there's people who are doing this in Japan and in Europe, and these companies have 300, 400 million in funding, but they're doing this operation unprofitably, and they're just wasting investors' money. We understand that we're going to be profitable from our first operation, and we're gonna scale out from there. Our, our goal is to reach a critical, critical mass with a supermarket chain in the United States to be the leader in North America in this, in this growing category. Thanks. Uh, Kathy, your question, please. Uh, yeah, uh, Sanjay, thank you very much. The, does the customer supply the land footprint for the greenhouses? It, it was a little unclear in terms of, uh, in addition to supplying money, what is the responsibility of your customer, who, who would be the, the grocery stores in this case? So, um, so Good. No, go on, please. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a supermarket customer, we'll either be growing on the rooftop, the back or the front parking lot, so that it becomes a really great site to see your food growing, grown locally. And to do that, we'll either partnership with the, partner with the supermarket's land for their rooftop or with a real estate company that manages the supermarket center that they work in. Okay, thanks. Mark, uh, you have a question, please. Yeah, Sanjay, thanks. Um, you may have mentioned this, but I may, I may have missed it. Is there, is there a particular supermarket chain or brand that you guys already have some kind of a, you know, an, an MOU with or an agreement with to do some kind of a pilot with, whether it's Albertson, Kroger, whatever it is at this stage? So we have an NDA signed with one customer that's an extremely large one that is looking to purchase between two and 10 acres of our solution, which is an extremely massive purchase. And then for the sake of, the, of a pilot purchase in the United States, we're currently in talks with the USC Hospitality Group. They already have a vertical farm solution in, and we're, have, we're uh, currently in talks with them. They said they'll buy as much as we can produce and they're also providing the real estate in order for us to partner with them. Just come back to one last question. I'll keep, I'll keep it quick, but um, in terms of the way you are presenting this to you know, particular customers, is the fact that the merchandisability of this having almost kind of like this uh, farmer's market, if you will, in the back of a particular store, is maybe even a, a draw for different kinds of customers from a curiosity factor, from a crowd-pleasing factor? Is that kind of factored into the way you're selling this? 
A hundred percent. So people are very interested in having a uh, upfront understanding that this has grown hyper locally, pesticide free, and the most sustainable you can really get in the world. And that's a big marketing plus for the supermarkets. And we plan on partnering at an equity level with that supermarket chain so that they're very much incentivized to grow our brand um, and actually make more money because they're, they're getting into the farming business as a partnership with us. Thank you. Uh, Charlie, what, what's your question, please? So for a standard grocery store, uh, what's your what size of a footprint do you propose uh, for supplying the microgreens, and how do you understand how much of a demand there is going to be for the microgreens? So it's about 20 square feet for a container and a greenhouse, and that can fit on top of most average supermarkets. It can also fit in the back or the front parking lot. And this size footprint uh, will produce 200 to 300 thousand dollars gross per year, and it'll cost us less than 100 thousand dollars to deliver. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, it does. I'm still a little unclear on, on how the, what you're putting on the ground. Um, it, it would be a container, which is an indoor farm. It's stacked like, you know, like stacks of, of plants growing. It's a nursery and a greenhouse right next to it where the plants mature in final stage. So the greenhouse would be bigger than the indoor production center and the greenhouse would have a clear outlining so you can see through it and see all the plants being grown in all their, you know, glory. And you manage the process. The grocery store doesn't manage it. The grocery yep. store does not manage it. It's a turnkey solution. They'll be a part of it. So they'll be receiving inventory regularly and, and placing it on their shelves and it'll basically harvest to order. So it'll pretty much always be ultra fresh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, if we still have time for any more questions? Oh, we have 30 seconds left. Benton, why don't you run with those 30 seconds? Okay, oh, second. quick one for you, Sanjay. Um, you ramp up sales from 100 to 250 very quick, but you last through what the profits were. I couldn't see it on your microscopic uh, screen there. Can you tell me about what your profits are for year three, four, five? Uh, I can. Let me bring it up. So. In years three, four, and five, our gross profits are going to be 10 million, 51 million, and 100 million. And the reason why we're able to scale up this quickly in profits is that our co founder, Dr. or not Dr. Dave Katragata, um, he has about half a billion dollars in assets, and he's agreed to give debt to the company in order to finance the fleet of farms that is being sold to the supermarkets. So um, we have the, the ability to scale in the opportunity without massive venture financing. And uh, that get, keeps our profitability nice because after two years, you can get SBA loans and pay those loans off for every year. You're, you're, you're taking a nice 7.7% interest loan rather than taking expensive equity money. So that's the reason why the profitability ramps up quite quickly. So that's straight debt, not a revenue redemption model? Straight debt, yeah. Okay, so 10, 51, and 100, and that's based on what revenues for those years? It's, re it's based on $200,000 gross per container. And the revenue for those years is 12 million, 24 million, and 124 million. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Thomas is back. So we're going to go to Thomas. Good presentation, Sanjay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. All right. Um, Thomas, uh, you can get started. Everybody, please evaluate. Sorry, Kathy, we can't take your. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Question. That's fine. <laughs> You hoo can everybody hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yes. Awesome. I was on the call for two hours, and then all I hear is uh, JJ saying, next up is Thomas from Leafpack, and then all of a sudden, I'm just kicked out. It's like, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, JJ, I was actually going to, uh, you know, commend you and congratulate you on a fantastic event, but now I think I might hold that back just a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anyway, all right, uh, I'm ready. So um, my name is Thomas, I'm from Scandinavia. That's why I have this weird accent, I apologize. Uh, Leaf Pack, uh, the mission of Leaf Pack is to replace single use plastics and to do that profitably. So it's not just an excellent opportunity for a high growth, um, high profitability business, but it's also actually a chance for us all to go out there 
and make a difference. Um, it, making a little light of it, but we're looking for our, you know, our Tony Stark to join our Captain America's efforts here. We have a fantastic technology platform and we're starting with a cup. And you might ask why a cup? Uh, you see, wherever you get your nice cup of coffee from, it could be Starbucks, McDonald's, etc. They're served to you in great cups. And all of those, absolutely all coffee cups are coated with plastics. It needs to be done because the paper needs to be water and heat resistant. And it's the same for any other uh, fast food item container that you use. They're all coated with plastic. And unfortunately, none of them get recycled. So the industry calls this wish cycling, greenwashing, etc. Those are not my terms. Um, and they might sound funny, but they're actually kind of catastrophic. Um, if we look at just coffee cups, that's 50 billion coffee cups just in the U.S. And in the capital of coffee, which Seattle likes to be called, um, if we made a tower out of those coffee cups, it'll make the Space Needle look very small indeed. It's a huge problem. So what have we done? Well, we, for, as a first step, we've applied our technology and we produce a uh, plant fiber cup. And we apply our secret coating, a, uh, just a secret sauce. And the result is a cup made out of 100% natural materials. Here it is. It's a cup so natural, you could eat it. it. You shouldn't, but you could eat it. Unless you're on a very high fiber diet, I wouldn't recommend eating it. Um, but it's plant fiber and sand, and it biodegrades naturally in nature, completely. No treatment needed. This is all new materials handling. It's a new manufacturing methods and it's strictly controlled through trade secret. If we look at the market uh, size, we have, as mentioned, around 50 billion cups and growing a year in the US alone. It's around a $2 billion industry with over a hundred producers. So it's a very fragmented market, which means it's slightly easier to go in and capture some market share. Particularly when we have such a fantastic product that we can deliver at the current pricing. That means we can deliver a fully natural substitute without any price premium. That is a wonderful sales uh, proposition. While still earning, of course, earning 10%, 10 cents per cup. Um, the way we're going out there and selling it is we have multiple um, uh, customer segments, but for us, it's very critical, mission critical, that we have for the first year or two a mentality of a phase one approach where we're trying to establish a bridgehead. We need investment for establishing the manufacturing and achieving the critical mass so we can start the, after that focusing on growth and after that position ourselves to maybe consider a big strategic partnership or licensing, et cetera. Important for investors is to know that with three, five, maybe six clients, that is all we actually need. Five to six good clients, that's all we need to complete, successfully complete phase one. We have already signed LOIs, so that is spectacular progress as is. Um, in terms of financing, we're looking for a, uh, we're doing a round now for a try with a target of 1.4, and it is to deliver a typical manufacturing plant it's important for me to highlight these manufacturing plants are typically smaller. They're, you know, people have something large in mind when they hear manufacturing plant, but these are typically smaller, eight to 10 man operations. Um, and this investment will complete phase one and allow us to gain that solid bridgehead. Just for reference purposes, the two co-founders have spent uh, two years on this and over $200,000 in cash, additionally. 30 seconds. The, um, the revenue projections are quite substantial, 65 million, uh, which is around less than 1% of market share in, uh, in the market. So there is a lot of room for growth. In terms of the senior team, they're all handpicked to deliver uh, manufacturing and R&D. And we hope when you look at critical mission functions, uh, crit mission critical functions from, st uh, from senior management that we, we've got you covered. We're part of Greentown Labs and Wayfinder. Uh, so a shout out to Richard, thanks for that. Uh, we have um, excellent M&A and growth options, frenemies like Tetra Pak and Reynolds, of course, but also the giant bears in the industry in general packaging like uh, Procter & Gamble and Unilever, they're all interested in this stuff. 
and Bain Capital and BlackRock are actually also investing in the uh, market segment. So there's actual excellent opportunities for growth and exit, part or full. So thank you very much. That is Project Leaf Pack. Uh, this is all starting with a cup, but you can easily imagine where this goes in terms of other fast food containers. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I see that uh, Amy's first on the list with a question. Please go ahead, Amy. Hey, thanks for being here. Um, totally agree, it's a big problem. You know, Starbucks and others have been trying to crack this forever. And so if you've truly discovered it, yay, um, keep going. I, the biggest question I have when I looked at the pitch um, in our first round was, how do you plan on building credibility through validation, right? So usually when I vet um, technologies for, for commercialization, I wanna see at least some third party, you know, R&D shops or private labs or somebody signing off saying, yep, totally legit. Um, I think in this one, particularly for the kind of consumer side, consumer facing UX on it, I'd wanna know what am I drinking out of? Is it some, you know, new alternative poison or something better, right? So I think you're gonna to have to answer to that to the various market segments from the big corporates and the ESG players to the, the uh, direct consumer stuff. Um, yeah. How are you? How are yeah. you no, we, we got you covered. We have third party uh, research and testing already done. So not just in terms of performance uh, within what's called water vapor, which is the impermeability, but also oxygen transfer rates and also compostability. So I, I mean the sharing, I mean the sharing. So how are you, what, what you know, institutions or, or what can you share with the public and with your partners um, for, that, for that verification? Everything so here is a strict trade secret. We've really debated internally whether to IP it or not, but this is high volume manufacturing, low cost manufacturing. So if we declared it, it would, we would have a Chinese copycat the very next day. But of course, we're quite open and ready and willing. As soon as we go into due diligence, of course, you need to see how it's done and what's in. You know. Thanks. Yeah, no, and I, I totally get that trade off. I just, I think that's gonna be a barrier for you guys. Yeah. We're gonna I can that. tell you as much that this cup here is um, plant fiber, virgin softwood. I'm sorry for the name, but that's what the industry calls it. And sand, that's all it is. All right, well, th thank you for that answer. Uh, Mark, uh, please go ahead with your question. Great, thanks, Thomas. Um, in, in terms of where the trade secret lives, not what it is, but where it lives, is, is, that, is that part of the, um, basically the process innovation that happens at the, at the factory center? In other words, is this, is this a new manufacturing system uh, that requires different kinds of new machining, different kinds of skills to operate? Because you're talking about a small footprint kind of contract manufacturer. So I'm just wondering, you don't have to tell the trade secret, but is that where, what's proprietary? Is that where it lives? Exactly. Right. First stage of it is fiber containers, which is a, a, a normally uh, used manufacturing methods for the initial containers, but the secret sauce is the coating. It is not a polymer. It doesn't need to get separated at recycling, uh, which is why they don't get recycled at the moment. Um, and I can say as much as we are using existing machinery, but completely fine tooling it. So we're changing, uh, we have all sorts of different elements that we put into it. So the answer is yes and no. It is completely new manufacturing. Uh, all other cups, for example, here in the US are what's called a rolled cup. So you will have a cup with a seam down the side where it's then glued together, if you go to Starbucks or anything. Our cup is a thermal form, so there's zero seam, there's no leakage, etc. Does it hold heat better for coffee? Yes, indeed, thank you. That's one of the elements. So you don't need a, um, you don't need a, a sleeve, so that's less expense and also less waste management. Thank you. It's not only heat, by the way, but also cold. Yeah. Heat and cold. And you can microwave it because there's no glue that that disintegrates. A new form of packaging potentially beyond a cup. Completely. You, you wouldn't believe the applications areas. If I may, I'd like to skip over Blair and, and, and give uh, Phil Gill a chance to ask a question. I don't think he's had a chance up till now. Uh, yeah. I, I've currently invested in a company that does the exact same thing. I'm just wondering how solid is your IP? So we're doing strict, uh, strict trade secret and the only real competitors we've seen in this area are um, companies using PLA as their, um, their, their magic material. And PLA unfortunately is a polymer and it needs to get separated from the paper and therefore they never actually get recycled. All right, thank you for that. Uh, are, are there any other questions? Stephen, is there time for any other questions? 
We have 20 seconds. Oh, Blair, maybe you can ask. Uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, please. Curious ab about your pricing assumption. Um, given that you are in the early stages of manufacturing it and will be building the plant, how do you have such confidence that you can match pricing of what's already out there? Um, we are a f four very experienced uh, business professionals with over 20, 30 years of experience in manufacturing, in clean tech manufacturing. And our current calculations for, uh, this is very specific, I'm sorry, but for a 16 ounce cup uh, insulated, our manufacturing co costs, uh, the cogs will be around um, three cents, plus minus a little bit, uh, depending on whether we get the smaller machines or the larger machines. Uh, the current market sales price for a 16 ounce insulated cup, if you go to Cisco or Uline, if you buy high volumes, as in a thousand at a time, that's around 14 cents per cup. So that's more than 10 cents per cup. And that's a 16 ounce insulated cup. Thomas, thank you. Um, everyone, please evaluate while we're transitioning. Thank you for to... your patience. Yeah, thanks, Thomas. Uh, thank until we, uh, I think we have the last company. Uh, and that is uh, RRTC. So. Is, is Meet Tero still yet to be done? Um, and they're, they never joined today, and I just looked up, and um, they never actually acknowledged um, that they're coming through, so I didn't realize that till now. So, uh, so Mitero is, is out. I see that. <laughs> All right, Richard, here we go. Last but not least, Richard. Okay, can you see me and hear me? We can, yes. All right. Share Very your good. screen if you want to. Yes, I definitely do. Um, so let me get ready for that. Okay, so share screen and we go here. And we go into presentation mode. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, um, I'm Rich Ryman. Um, I am the founder and CEO of RTC, and I am going to tell you all about advanced composite materials. Um, first of all, anybody who's looked at advanced composite materials knows two things. One, they're very expensive. Two, you can't get them in every type of form that uh, you might want them in. Um, and if you don't believe me, go out and buy a carbon fiber reinforced bike frame and see how much you spend on it. Uh, it'll be very expensive. Even a little strip spoiler on the back uh, of a car made of carbon fiber is very, is very expensive. So I'm introducing a new technology for advanced composite materials. Uh, and it's based on a manufacturing process called low temperature solidification. This is a patented recyclable drop-in platform manufacturing process for ceramics, metals, and polymers. And the reason why this is uh, so unique from anything else that's out there is because low temperature solidification allows us to make ceramic bonds at temperatures lower than that required for metals or plastics. So that enables us to mix these ingredients together and co-process them together. And having that ability allows us to make new kinds of material structures and chemistries that have never been seen before. And so below are examples of things that we've been capable of doing that no one else knows how to do, such as having co-continuous uh, interpenetrating networks of ceramics and metals, uh, ceramics and plastics, even continuous fibers, uh, where you have carbon fibers in a ceramic matrix that ordinarily, under conventional processing, would uh, oxidize the fibers. Let's go to the next. Oh, um, so uh, basically, uh, what we're targeting market-wise uh, in the early stages of the company 
um, are wood replacement materials and long in surface life of fractures. And you're probably asking why you're doing that. Um, well, because we want to demonstrate market traction very early on in some of the big target items that we want to go after, such as um, automobile light weighting and wind turbine blades are great applications, great markets, but we have to build our skill set first to have the kind of chops that are needed to be able to execute on those processes. So we have what set up a technology roadmap that allows us to earn while we learn, so to speak. So um, in any case, what all of the business areas that we've identified um, mean is a great reduction in CO2 emissions and uh, much uh, um, large reduction in the amount of energy that's actually consumed. Um, just to let you know where we are so far um, with JDA and licensing revenue and one of the things I omitted to tell you is that we are a technology licensing company. And so we're going after businesses that are greatly in need of improvement and building drop-in technology that allows them to use their current capital to switch over our process, uh, switch over to our process. So in doing that, um, we have uh, a signed JDA that's generating revenue and uh, will generate licensing revenue uh, uh, in 2021, which is why we chose that application. I can tell you about that later, but it allows us to receive revenue in an early stage. Um, what we're doing now is raising a $4 million Series A round. We want to use those funds to expand the team, file patents, and accelerate growth. And eventually, we want to go from a licensing business model to include manufacturing. And we'll start manufacturing when we don't have a drop in uh, technology um, and we have enough revenue to build our own manufacturing. Um, we expect our revenue to increase to 36 million with 21 million of EBITDA by 2024. And in 2024, that'll mean uh, a 20, a 10 X return on investment uh, based on EV to EBITDA ratio. Um, we have a great team where we have very experienced people handling our finances, our, our business development. Um, our advisory board is a very well-skilled um, entrepreneur uh, who's been involved in over a hundred different ventures. And we have great engineering group in addition to the two engineers shown on the slide here. We also have two more engineers who are at Rutgers University. So if you are interested, get in touch with me. Here's the contact information. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, do we have any questions? Please raise your hand. Charlie, you're first up. Please go ahead. So it sounds like a fascinating technology. What, what is the secret sauce? Why is this, uh, why are you the ones who are coming out with it now? And can you just explain without violating any, uh, privacy, um, how this all works. Sure, it's really easy. And for some reason, the world at large has only overlooked the easiest goddamn thing uh, you could imagine in making materials. All you do is you take a particulate solid of, of that, it has to have ceramic in it, okay? That's one of the requirements. You form it uh, via a shape, via a myriad of different technologies. So any forming technique, you can put in front of me that's used in industry can be used, which is one of the reasons why it's dropping. Then what you do is you take this porous body and you infiltrate it with an aqueous solution. And the aqueous solution reacts with the ceramic particles in the mixture to create a bonding uh, matrix. And that matrix happens to be a ceramic structure. Um, and usually when you work with powders in the ceramics field, you have shrinkage that takes place and that prevents you from making really large objects. Our process does not have any shrinkage, which will allow anyone that wants to make something large out of ceramic to go ahead and do it. And, and we have already made process, products of very large scale, um, as large as 50 feet long by five feet wide by eight inches thick. No one in ceramics can do that now. And we are patented internationally in 19 
regions of the world. And um, uh, we have structure matter, composition of matter, as well as process uh, and product by process and apparatus patents. So we have an enormous amount of IP. That was my next question. <laughs> well, Mark, why, why don't you ask the next, next question, please? Oh, that's a that's a nice. I, I like I like families of IP. Um, you're raising a Series A. Uh, for what purpose is that? To basically elevate from licensing to becoming a manufacturing company, or what's what's the strategy? No, we just need. We have a queue of clients who want to work with us, and our engagement model is to basically show them in a very short period of time that we can make a product that meets roughly the metrics of what that uh, client wants to do. Not what they have currently, but what they want to do if they could. And so we basically, through communication with them, find out, well, what is it that you want to do and what do we have to do to prove to you that we know how to do it? We do that on our dime with the investor money, but once we show them what was their uh, indication of proof that we can do it, they have to pay from there on in. And once they pay, we can add an employee. So for example, when we hit the $36 million mark in revenue, we're gonna have 43 employees in the company. And most of them aren't gonna be supported by that 4 million, because you know 4 million goes quick. Okay. Well, that, that answer your question, Well, uh, Yeah, that's fine, thank you. Sure. Uh, Jerry, why don't you ask the next question, please? Um, I think you said you're raising four million. Um, yes. And what is the valuation, please? We're we're about sixteen million right now, pre and then after investment twenty. Thank you. And you know we have a lot of IP. That's one of the reasons. <laughs> and we also don't require a lot of capital, almost no capital because we do everything on the premises of the customer to prove that we can do it in their space. Uh, I'm not sure if I saw another question. Uh, I don't know, Benton, did you have a question? I did, but Jerry asked it point blank. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Valuation on that quick 4 million. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I don't see any other questions, so. That, one, one, All right, Richard. Okay, did, did I tell you guys that we were part of the Pepperdine most fundable companies? We were we were a gold company. Not as valuable as platinum, but you know, I think I think gold's nicer looking. We like gold. We like platinum. We like silver. All's good. Quality All right. Thank you, Richard, very much for. Oh, you're presentation. very welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you guys. And uh, oh, one of you wants to reach into your pocket and uh, and join us. Well, Richard, uh, believe it or not, uh, we are making introductions to a lot of companies. Uh, so uh, I, I know as soon as uh, I hear back from some of the investors, if they're interested, we will reach out to you. Sure. The other thing I didn't emphasize was the huge play on carbon. We can make carbon negative materials, meaning it takes more CO2 in than it actually takes to manufacture the material. All right. Thank you very much. Great yeah. presentation. Uh, yeah, appreciate your you. time. Yep. Sorry. For All right. Um, judges, investors, thank you so much for, and, and sponsors, uh, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, we have, a, I, I don't know if you're on the FinTech. Uh, FinTech is on a Thursday afternoon. Um, otherwise, um, next week we have three more, and then uh, we will go into the final round. So just the uh, the final round, uh, you know, everybody's part of the final round, which is uh, split into two parts. I think it's on November 12th and November 17th. We would have eight companies, and then they will be presenting 12 minutes each and 12 minutes Q&A. So it's a little bit longer. That's why we split them over two different sessions. Um, so again, thank you for your time. Kathy, thank you. Amy, everyone, thank you for being here. We really appreciate the time. Yeah, are we going to dialogue among us around it just to ensure we Please. kind of have a screening over the? Well, you know what? Let me let me let me uh, remove the attendees uh, for now, so that way we can have a quick dialogue here. 
Otherwise, they're going to hear it. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. No, please, yeah, that is not a good idea. All right, I'm going to. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Thanks. Um, all right. Um, not that I don't trust the star system, you know, I've been starring things left and right <laughs> during this session. <laughs> but yeah, so <laughs> attendees, if you can leave, it would be great. So I don't have to really kick you out. So <laughs> we're going to have a short discussion. So. Four stars for gold and five for platinum, right? <laughs> how many how many Pepperdine winners did we have today? Uh, how Two many three? were part of this in Pepperdine? I don't know why. Can you can you look it up, Stephen? I I, can, I don't have it in front of me. So yeah, let me look it up. Um, so we have a total of, uh, I think, uh, nine from Pepperdine uh, for the entire competition. Nine or 10, I don't remember. Can we tell if it's just us at this point? Looks like it, right? And uh, now it is. <laughs> yeah, I find it really helpful to hear from others because some, some of the verticals and spaces I don't know as well, you know, like Ben shared with me, the wind tool design isn't unique. I, I don't know that space super deep. So it'd be great just to hear if anybody sees reasons for any of them to sort of be maybe out of the top three or something like that, just to screen it. Yeah, anyone? I didn't understand, uh, I didn't understand uh, growing vegetables or strawberries at a supermarket. I, I mean, which one is that, Phil? The, the, the vertical uh, growing. The vertical <laughs> growing at a supermarket. Plant culture, I think. Plant oh, culture. Yeah. Right. And that was, thing, thing I, had, I, had to th I have to tell you, it took me a while to figure that one out and try to understand. <laughs> oh, well, that was, that was a difficult one for me. It's been a hard one on the West Coast for people to be um, successful business case wise. One of them folded last year after multiple mm -hmm. rounds, although QFC here is actually doing vertical end cap farming hydroponic lettuce in Seattle. Um, I would love to see it take off. I just haven't seen it work in the market here but yeah, yeah as we saw with grow guru it's hard enough to get farmers to farm correctly and profitably to introduce yeah. that into a retail environment is i think a big ask uh, uh, Stephen, uh, uh please stop the recording also so that way